This is part three in a series of videos on the obesity epidemic. If you haven't seen them, you probably should. Also, my camera is out of focus for like half of the video, so just close your eyes and pretend it's a podcast where I occasionally hit the microphone with my hat. Thank you. Viewer discretion is advised. Regulatory capture is a term used to refer to when special interest groups successfully lobby the governmental bodies in charge of governing them. Historically, Big Tobacco was very successful at getting the government to rule in favor of them until the science against smoking was just so undeniable that the hammer came crashing down. In a lot of ways, Big Food is the new Big Tobacco. Today, a tiny few companies enjoy a monopoly over the food that we eat, which might be hard to believe at first glance. Grocery store shelves are filled with colorful brands all competing for a spot on your grocery cart. But that competition is largely a facade as a handful of mega corporations control the majority of spots on the shelves through subsidiaries and sub-brands. Mega corporations like PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Tyson Foods, Nestle, Danone, Mars, and so on control two-thirds of grocery sales according to a report by The Guardian. And this is just groceries. Consider that Americans on average eat out multiple times a week, which is an industry similarly dominated by a few mega behemoths. I think it's fair to say that big food easily controls up to 90% of the food that we eat. And such concentrated power has had clear effects. A 2006 report found that one third of the FDA scientists believed that the agency was more concerned with rushing new products to market than with the safety of the American people. Scientists reported feeling pressured by leadership to unethically change data or alter their conclusions to support the interests of big corporations. While a 2011 report noted remarkable improvements, problems with corruption remain a big issue at the FDA, and the USDA is no better. A report noted that of those appointed to the 2020 committee that determines the United States' nutrition guidelines for the next five years, over half had ties to the Koch-funded International Life Sciences Institute. The report concluded that the food and soft drink industry has too much influence over U.S. dietary guidelines. But the control of big food goes beyond just regulatory capture. Some economists have coined the term deep capture to refer to private interests influencing not just the government, but the public at large, spreading ideas and propaganda that benefit their bottom line. In 2014, two economists set out to develop an economic model of big food corporations and their influence on consumers' decisions, and identified three key messages the industry was pushing out. First, losing weight is simple. It's all about counting calories. It's not about what you eat, but how much. By shifting the conversation away from what we eat, Big Food emphasizes that no food is inherently fattening. You can drink as much Coke as you want, so long as you stay at a calorie maintenance. But while a calorie is a calorie, our body doesn't just burn calories efficiently like a furnace. The metabolic process is complicated, and the ways in which food influences our blood sugar and insulin is really important. And unsurprisingly, hyper-processed foods that make up the majority of what we eat are probably the worst foods you can eat if you're trying to lose weight or maintain it. The second talking point surrounds exercise. The Center for Consumer Freedom, a nonprofit front for the food industry, pushes out articles like the truth about the obesity debate that declares the epidemic is the sole result of a lack of exercise. Not an unhealthy food environment promoted by big companies, it's just a lack of exercise, guys, come on. Why didn't we think about that? They're joined by the likes of Coke and others who publish ads on how to work off the calories from a Coke or a Big Mac. Combined with the first message, we start getting a more clear picture of what they want us to believe. It's about how much you eat and how much you move. But definitely more important than these first two is their last message, let consumers choose. The food industry relentlessly fights every tax, regulation, and nutrition guideline that the government puts out. And it does so on the basis that it's fundamentally the consumer's right to make food choices, not the government's. Which essentially blames individual purchasing decisions for obesity, conveniently letting them off the hook. These three aren't their only propaganda tools in their arsenal. But these three messages put together are especially important because they're exactly the way most people view obesity and exactly the way the government has chosen to tackle the epidemic. 
They give us information, online calorie calculators. They promote exercise and well-being and just let the consumer choose what to do. Instead of subsidizing healthier alternatives, implementing limits on advertising or nutritional guidelines, or literally any kind of regulation on big food whatsoever that would be better than what we've been stuck with. Whether this was done due to corruption or incompetence, I'm not here to say. But it is clear that big food has laid the groundwork for our current mess. So why doesn't the consumer choice model work? Well, put simply, the stuff we put in our mouths isn't determined by simple hunger calculations in the brain. There's a large body of research suggesting that our dietary behavior is very complicated and it's influenced by factors like our emotional state, habits, stress level, and social setting. And these factors can be manipulated. When you go to the supermarket, the aisles are scientifically designed to get you to consume more, and much of that consumption being hyper-processed, unhealthy foods. These foods are designed in factories to be as hyper palatable as possible, as unnutritious as possible, and as unsatiating as possible. And in the words of one Stanford professor, these factories are kept windowless because they don't want you to see what's going on in there. Because if you did, you wouldn't eat it. Okay, truly. Children are advertised to from the moment that they're born into consuming addictive sugary treats. And this pattern of consumption continues into adulthood. They will literally do anything to get you to consume more. They will literally pump fake aromas into stores to get you to buy more. All these manipulations put together have created what researchers call an obesogenic environment, meaning an environment that causes obesity. As we covered in the first video, the obesity epidemic is an epidemic of malnutrition. Not in the traditional sense of malnutrition that conjures up images of starving children in the third world, but malnutrition meaning an imbalance of nutrition, meaning we have an excessive intake of nutrients that hurt our body, and often not enough nutrients that our body actually needs. And while our bodies deteriorate, the obesity epidemic has been a boon to big food. Bigger bodies require more energy to maintain and so more profits for them. If the way companies promote unhealthy behavior in the pursuit of profits doesn't infuriate you, I don't know what will. Because speaking as an obese person, being obese isn't fun. Before I started working out and losing weight, I got to the point where I was struggling to put on my shoes because it was hard to put one leg over the other. I mean, sure, it might be funny when a fat person in a movie sits in a chair and then it breaks, but when it's you sitting on a chair and you don't know whether it's gonna break, <laughs> that's fucking horrifying and not something I wish on anybody. <laughs> There's just so much you can't do, like simple things like walking your dog, making you tired. I mean, you can't keep up with your friends and you can't do all the things you wish you could do because you're too heavy, too unhealthy to enjoy life at the pace that you want. And it sucks. It really, really sucks and no flavor, no taste can compensate for that. So I, like many others, started looking for solutions to my obesity. If this was the 90s, I might have gone to a local clinic, told them my struggles with weight, and gotten prescribed Fenfen, a magical weight loss pill that exploded in popularity in the 1990s. By 1997, however, Fenfen was discovered to have caused heart disease in millions of people. It was quickly pulled from the market and tens of billions of dollars were paid to victims in damages. One might ask, how did such a dangerous drug get through the FDA's rigorous approval process? Well, if the food industry profits off of our obesity, the diet industry profits off of selling us snake oil. According to Dr. Paul Ernzberger, the guy whose research we disagreed with in the previous video, he had a pretty insightful view into the FenFen approval process. The drug was approved based on one small 1992 study that Ernzberger argues was paid for by the drug's manufacturers. The lead scientist of that study was then hired by the FDA, where he campaigned for FenFen's approval. The obesity field was firmly united in its support for the passage of the drug. But as Ernzberger writes, the obesity field had been just as impressively united behind many failed treatments, including intestinal bypass surgery, zero calorie diets, liquid protein diets, jaw wiring, thyroid pills, and so on. At the panel, testimony came from Joanne Manson of the Harvard Medical School, who argued that while yes, the drug had fatal side effects, obesity was so deadly, it was worth the risk. 
To many critics, this mentality can be summed up in two words, diet culture. A persistent set of beliefs that hold weight not only as the primary indicator of a person's health, but as the supreme indicator of a person's worth. The genealogy of diet culture is long and complicated. We kind of partly got into it in the previous video, but in the modern day it manifests in many ways, through Instagram fad diets, TikTok fitness influencers, and weight obsessed doctors. You don't need me to tell you that diet culture has had a pervasive effect on culture at large. And despite the growing power of diet culture and the fitness industry, obesity has only gone up. Clearly, we had failed at dealing with the obesity epidemic. And so in response, we got health at every size. As we've covered already, haze is a major paradigm shift in the way doctors treat obesity. As an alternative, Hayes proposes that we 1. encourage body acceptance, 2. support intuitive eating, and 3. support active embodiment, which is a new age way of saying exercise. By emphasizing lifestyle change, reshaping our relationships with food, and moving our body in ways that we enjoy, Hayes promises to support health in a sustainable way. As a relatively new approach, there's only a limited number of studies available to support it, but those that do exist are promising with participants reporting increased self-esteem, better metabolic fitness and eating behavior, and the effects lasted for longer than participants who just did regular old caloric restriction to lose weight. There are a few limitations to the studies, but I think they're valuable in showing that a new approach to obesity is possible, especially one that's more compassionate and holistic like Hayes. By emphasizing psychological and spiritual health beyond just losing weight, Hayes shows promise in treating obesity in individuals with an obesity that is especially traumatizing to their mental health. And for that, I commend the Hayes approach, I really do. But that's where my praise ends, because we have to address the elephant in the room. Hayes is a weight neutral approach, meaning it doesn't exactly treat obesity. Most people in Hayes interventions don't lose weight at all. Which is fine if someone's underweight or a little bit overweight, but take one look at the stories that are posted on places like Reddit of people who try haze and intuitive eating who are already severely obese, and you see a bunch of stories of people going up 20, 30 pounds when they're already like 300, which is incredibly dangerous as we covered in the previous video. And I know these are just anecdotes, but I think they're recurring enough that it poses a genuine question. Hayes supporters argue that while well, yes, some people may experience weight gain upon starting the intervention as they learn to listen to their body's internal hunger cues and their brain learns to leave restriction mode. As their body adjusts, they will eventually reach their natural body set point, a weight range they'll be anchored to for the rest of their lives. Some Hayes supporters go even further, arguing that for 99% of people, fighting your body set point is impossible. How valid is this? Well, obese people do have a tendency to regain any lost weight, and being at a caloric deficit will trigger metabolic adjustments to the body that will make the mere act of trying to lose weight incredibly difficult. And a big part of this has to do with genetics. Research shows that obesity is strongly influenced by genetics and epigenetics. Some individuals will naturally have larger appetites, lower levels of satiety, and a body that just has the propensity to pack on pounds. While we do all live in an obesogenic environment, our genetics and epigenetics play a major role in determining who gets obesity and who doesn't. The combination of genetics and body set point probably contribute a great great deal to the 95% failure of diets, which is a number fat activists love to cite. Dr. Fatima Cody Sanford, who treats obesity and isn't exactly a fat activist but talks about this a lot, argues that even when her patients lose weight, they have to be supervised and treated for the rest of their lives, because genetics and body set point are so powerful that if the treatment were ever to cease, she believes 97% of her patients would regain the weight even if they'd been maintaining it for years. This is a pretty grim picture, and if it were true, I'd be all about a weight neutral approach like Hayes. Because if just dieting and losing weight is really that impossible, then what's the point? But surprise, surprise, it's not that simple. Let's start with the failure rate of diets. 
One 2001 meta-analysis found that most participants in weight loss studies maintained an average weight loss of over 6 pounds after 5 years, which isn't a lot. But another 2005 study found that 20% of participants were able to maintain a weight loss of over 10% of their original weight, which isn't a small number. If I lost and maintained that weight, I'd go down 4 BMI points. Another 2011 study found that after 4 years, 45% of dieters managed to keep 5% of the original weight off, and a 2014 study found that after 10 years, 87% of dieters who lost more than 30 pounds were able to maintain weight loss of 10% of their original body weight, which is a huge success rate. But why do these studies vary so wildly? Well, each study is using a different method, they're using different methods of accounting for a person's weight, like self-reporting versus researchers actually measuring their weight. This is just a big problem in nutritional studies in general. But when it comes to diet studies, they tend to self-select towards people who already struggle with weight loss. So ideally, we'd want to look at the average person's experience with weight loss. That's why the 2014 study, which was the last one I talked about, was so important because it was the first one to focus on normal dieters that did it without any medical interventions. Similarly, a 1999 survey found that, of those surveyed, 35% had intentionally managed to lose at least 10% of their body weight, and at the time of questioning, half of them had kept the weight off for one year, and a quarter had kept it off for five. Now, these aren't the most mind-blowing results. A 25% chance of keeping off a moderate amount of weight off is... I mean, it's alright. But compare it to the failure rate of New Year's resolutions, which is like 88%, or the failure rate of veganism, which is like 84%, or the failure rate of quitting smoking, which is like in the 90s. I figure the odds of losing weight are way better than the odds will stick to any given habit. And I mean, of course losing weight is hard. Successful weight loss means not just successful habit building, but total lifestyle change. You need to learn to live at a new caloric deficit, and then learn to live at a new caloric maintenance never before being able to eat the way you used to, or else you'd go back up in weight. But something being challenging doesn't make it bad. And as the research shows, it's definitely possible for a whole lot of people. So is the body set point just wrong? Well, no. But it is wrong the way fat activists use it. A 2014 study found that most people put on about half a pound of weight every winter and never lose it, leading to a ever-increasing body mass. We don't all just have a natural body set point set at morbid obesity. That's ridiculous. Our obesogenic environment causes obesity, and our body's propensity towards packing and then keeping weight, along with our genetics, determine the mental and behavioral factors we'll have to overcome to lose it. Any claim to the contrary is fundamentally claiming that we don't have any free will or bodily autonomy, which I don't think the science bears out, but I also don't agree with philosophically. By enforcing these lies, we reinforce a dangerous, self-defeating attitude about what we as humans are capable of. With that said, not every weight loss plan is built equally, and we should take cues from Hayes and focus on compassionate, empathetic care. A 2015 study found that obese patients who believed that their doctors were supportive lost around 110 pounds over two years. Meanwhile, patients who didn't feel that their doctors were supportive lost less than 5 pounds. Another study from 1999 showed that patients who discussed weight loss with their doctors were more than 179% more likely to lose weight than patients who had doctors that avoided the topic entirely. When addressing weight loss, doctors should be careful in ensuring that they view each patient as an individual. By focusing on the specific reasons patients struggle with weight loss, doctors can guide them with educational resources that focus on lifestyle and diet, and therapeutic measures that focus on self-esteem and trauma recovery. A comprehensive and holistic approach like this can help anybody lose weight if they want to. 
And for that, we do have to thank Haze. It's given us new language and a new framework with which to understand obesity. But the wider cultural movement rejects the possibility of losing weight altogether, essentially condemning people with obesity to a lifetime with the condition. By and large, the fat activist movement promotes dangerous anti-science and places undue influence on big diet when it's big food that has predominant control over our lives. The argument that we live in a diet culture has become accepted as dogma in most politically aware circles. And while this is true, I want to push back a little bit on this notion that it's diet culture and fat phobia and weight stigma that are the big bads we should be focusing on. Because in my experience, and in the experience of Dr. Hajma Herman, author of Conquering Fat Logic, which is an amazing read that most of the studies in this video and the previous one have been cited from, we've been much more affected by fat culture than anything else. We know our bodies have changed over time, but our perceptions of our bodies have changed as well. There's a growing body of research that suggests that while normal weight people accurately understand their body, obese people tend to have a body dysmorphia opposite of those with anorexia. They tend to see themselves as smaller than they really are. A 2014 study of US adults found that only one third of Americans believe they're overweight despite two-thirds of us being so. And another study from that same year found that women saw anything under a BMI of 38 as normal. Studies of parents of overweight children have found that 80% of them viewed their children as being normal weight, which is a mentality passed down to their children as half of obese children and teens interviewed in a recent study believed that they were at a normal weight. And while I don't think we need to start badgering developing teens about their weight, it does reflect a sort of cultural fat blindness. And it does reflect my own personal experiences. It took me getting into a BMI around the mid 30s before my family started telling me anything. Anyone who's ever lost weight will tell you that once you start reaching a normal BMI, people will try to get you to stop losing weight, even if you're still overweight. And this might not just be misplaced jealousy. In a 2014 study that measured our perceptions of others, normal weight people tended to accurately estimate the weight category of those around them, but over 70% of obese people perceived people around them to be slimmer than they were. Dr. Herman shares her anecdotal experience in her book. That was definitely true for me. When I was still severely obese, I had the feeling that the whole world was skinny. And when I heard talk of an obesity epidemic, I would think, where? I'm the only fat person here. As society has gotten bigger and bigger, our objective understanding of our bodies has evaporated. Does this fat blindness contribute to fat activists talking about obesity alarmists? Maybe. But here's what we do know. Today, the CDC claims that over 42% of US adults are obese. There are more obese adults in the United States than there are overweight adults. And normal weight adults are becoming an increasingly shrinking category. The arguments that the health risks of fat are overblown are null and void when there's more obese people in this country than any other weight category and extreme obesity, like me, is the highest increasing category. Despite these mind-blowing numbers, it feels like doctors feel less and less empowered to talk about weight with their patients. While the conversation about the medical field and obesity usually centers around weight stigma and fat phobia, some research suggests that this isn't always the case. A 1999 report found that only 42% of obese patients had a doctor advise them to lose weight. And anecdotally, many doctors report feeling powerless in discussing weight with their patients often believing that even if they did bring it up, it'd be meaningless since their patients only ever gain weight and never lose it. As we've shown, a supportive doctor can be incredibly helpful in someone's weight loss journey, so doctors feeling like they don't have the tools or capacity to deal with this is criminal. With all that said, I can't go as far as Dr. Herman in dismissing fat phobia as a relevant factor here. As we've covered, obesity is a class issue, with the working class suffering the brunt of the damage and ideas like fat phobia, like in the Victorian era, have been passed down from the ownership class. 
In her book, Dr. Herman essentially asks, and I'm paraphrasing for her here so I might get her opinion a little bit wrong, but I believe that she's essentially asking, how much of a problem can fat phobia be in a predominantly fat society? But we also live in a society that's 50% women and majority working class with ideas that are very antagonistic to both of those. So I don't think that's really the right question to ask. Instead, I think the correct question is how do we define terms like fat phobia and other fat activist buzzwords like fat liberation? If you're watching this, I'm sure you'd agree that it's pretty fucked up to make fun of fat people. But what about normalizing, promoting class 3 obesity as being normal and healthy? We can all agree that our value isn't tied to our weight, and we have a right to enjoy our lives and pursue health at any size. But where do we cross the line from supporting individuals to enabling dangerous behavior? I honestly don't have an answer. But fatness is increasingly being elevated to other intersections of oppression, like race, class, and gender, and we need to be critical in how we approach this issue, especially when the words we use to discuss this are defined by fat activist circles, which, beyond being science denying, aren't known for being the most well-adjusted spaces. There are countless testimonies of people who were formerly body positive and health at every size advocates that left the movement and see it for what it truly is. You can find the videos on YouTube and other creators have done pretty good jobs at covering the topic, but my overwhelming interpretation of these groups is that they're highly traumatized people using these ideas to cope with their negative body image, and who interpret the mere act of a friend losing weight as an act of violence upon their psyche. Take one look at how these groups reacted to Adele's weight loss as an example of the toxicity on display here. And this shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, the political fat activist movement was born out of the activism of the white American middle class, a group that's not exactly known for its progressivism or for having a very strong political imagination. And so I've always been skeptical of the movement not just because of where it came from, but also because of what it fundamentally advocates for. Consume as you please. Fat activists define fat liberation as killing the diet cop in your head and only following the beat of your own drum. And while they do pay lip service to eating healthfully and mindfully, they don't question the inherent danger of promoting intuitive eating in an environment that's designed to manipulate our intuitions. When mega corporations meticulously craft our food environment to make our bodies crave more and more food, consuming the way fat activists want us to necessarily supports the bottom line of these companies. In no other issue do leftists support unlimited consumption. Animal rights? limit consumption of meat. The environment, limit buying and consumerism. Capitalism, you subvert it, in part, by consuming less. You think critically about your position within the system and find ways to support it less. It's just wild to me how so many leftists have been suckered into a movement that is fundamentally a liberal way of thinking. There is a focus on cultural issues like fat phobia and diet culture, but there's no energy for when it comes to examining the fundamental structures of our society like the production of food. But I don't think the idea of fat liberation is nonsense because with everything we've covered so far, we clearly have to liberate the American and increasingly global body. So how do we do so? Well first, medicalizing obesity will not, and pending the creation of a magical metabolism drug, will never solve the obesity epidemic. With that said, I do think there is a place for the medical world, and as we've covered, it should adopt a more empathetic and holistic approach to weight loss. Second, maximizing human health requires a major transformation of the system. Basic human nutrition cannot be seen as a for-profit industry because inevitably trade-offs will have to be made in the pursuit of profits. But still, some capitalist societies are doing way better than us, so I think there's some things we can do. Some solutions include nutrition regulations that limit advertising, amount, or price of sugary processed foods available for sale, subsidizing whole healthy foods so that everybody can afford the food that's healthy, making nutrition education widespread and accessible so people understand the basics of nutrition and can't get won over by diet snake oil, maybe, I don't know, some trust busting in the food industry. I'm just spitballing here. The list goes on. 
Dr. Herman is optimistic in that she sees the food industry in the same place Big Tobacco was before being regulated out of existence. I myself am more skeptical in that Big Food is way more powerful than Big Tobacco, and I don't think the government has the cajones to go after that lobby, but we'll see. But pending all that, individual change is possible for those who want it. So long as you have the time, mental energy, and knowledge to dedicate to weight loss, weight loss is possible. I'm doing it and it's an incredibly privileged position to be in. But no matter what anyone tells you, we do have the power to change our own bodies. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. With that said, I never want to talk about obesity again. Three videos. Jesus Christ. I'm fucking out of here. Fuck. See you in the next one.